thank you everybody for joining the Crest of Butte Mountain Heritage Museum for our History at Home series. Uh, my name is Nell Burkett. I'm the curator at the Crest of Butte Mountain Heritage Museum. Through this series, we aim to bring a diverse array of voices to dig into history from different perspectives. If you uh, have recommendations for speakers that you want to see in the future, feel free to shoot me an email at curator at crestofbuttemuseum.com. Um, we have switched up our programming a little bit, as I mentioned the last or a couple of weeks ago before Thanksgiving. We are now ending our History at Home series early. We'll be done, our last one's the 21st of January, because Dwayne Vandenbush is starting up with a History of Crested Butte specific series starting on January 28th. Um, and that will be 12 part series all about really, really local history. Uh, before I get going, I'd like to start the evening with a quick land acknowledgement. The museum recognizes that we are guests here on this land, historically Ute territory. We acknowledge that the mining and ranching community that established itself at the end of the 1800s was at the expense of the Uncompahgre Ute and Tabawatch Ute, who were forcibly removed from this area due to the Bruneau Treaty and the manipulation that followed. We hope that you will take time to visit our neighbor, the Ute Museum, located in Montrose, Colorado, with exhibits developed in partnership with the Ute Tribes by History Colorado, our state historical society. While we can never do this history justice, we do include information about Paleo Indians of the Gunnison Valley, the Ute people, the Bruneau Treaty, and the Los Pinos Indian Agency in our exhibits. The Crest of Mountain Heritage Museum knows that we have a great responsibility in representing many stories from our history, good and bad, and we continue to listen to those voices when they are ready to share. This program is being recorded and you can find this recording and all previous recordings at crestofbuttemuseum.com. We hope that you will consider becoming members or making a donation to support this program and the work that we do at the museum. You can do this also by visiting crestofbuttemuseum.com or by calling us at 349-1880. Uh, next week, for everybody, we've got Bobby Reinhardt giving us the history of dance. And uh, she showed up here in the 70s and built, helped to build the dance program. And so she's going to kind of give us an interesting look into how that has evolved in our community and how, um, you know, how the arts and culture of the 70s has continued to impact the community we are today. Uh, I already mentioned that Dwayne Vandenbush's series starts on the 28th. Uh, registration for that will be available here soon. We're just nailing down some final details and you'll be able to find that at crestofbuttemuseum.com. Finally, uh, we are in the middle of our holiday history raffle, which uh, the raffle features a week stay in Kilua, I'm gonna butcher this, Kalua, Kona, Hawaii, a week mm -hmm. stay in Molokai, Hawaii, a custom mm -hmm. pair of romp skis, a $500 cash prize, a $100 Crested Butte personal chef's dinner. So they make you dinner that uh, is in your own home, so it's COVID safe. A $100 speckled goose dinner, same, uh, same organization that it'll come to your home. And a, a museum membership package. Tickets are $550 for one or $26 for six and can be purchased through December 30th. The raffle drawing will take place online December 30th at 5.30 p.m. We are going to do questions at the end, so if you do have questions, please do post it in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jeff Taylor, currently chair of the Museum and Gallery Management Masters at Western Colorado University, but really has such a huge biography, I don't think I could really <laughs> list all of your qualifications. Um, so, Jeff, I'll give it to you to take it away. Thanks, Nell. Thanks. This is really fun. Thank you all for joining us. This is really a great chance for us to share this research project that we've been doing with really so many people throughout the valley that, I mean, in some ways I have to start by just telling the story of, of how this all started. So. With that, I'm gonna start, um, let me go ahead and start my presentation and holler now if I'm not doing it right. I hope I'm doing it right. So, um, we start with this picture here. Good, okay, now it says good. So we start with this picture here and this in some ways gets at the start of this exhibition, which, I'm going to start by just mentioning 
um, who we worked with, which is such a long list of names. First of all, um, Ethel Rice, Nicholas Reddy, Ivy Walker, Peggy Stenmark, uh, Heather Orr, Gail Jacobs, uh, <laughs> me, Nell, uh, Heather Thiessen Riley, Nicholas Fisher, Emily Moore, Chase Hutchinson, Schaefer Nickel, Jan Nixon, Brianna Radford, Jeff Irwin, Bailey Bacchus, Nicole Degatti, and Ryan Sullivan, all these people, as well as these organizations. And I'll explain how they all got involved. The Crested Butte Creative District Commission, our Masters in Gallery Management and Museum Management, um, the Quigley Gallery at Western, our Art Department, uh, the Crested Butte Mountain Heritage Museum and the Gunnison Pioneer Museum, all of them played really crucial roles in how this came about. But I come back to that picture and how this is really the starting point. It started really with a project that was proposed to the Crested Butte Creative District Commission by Nick Reddy and Ivy Walker um, and also Peggy Stenmark worked with them on it. Uh, to write an art history of Crested Butte, which was the proposal to which we gave some small funds from the creative district. And they worked on it. And one of the really amazing things they found was this photograph, which we knew, you can see versions of it at the Pioneer Museum. But what was most amazing about this picture that I think had gone kind of unnoticed is on the right side, we see the word in huge letters, the word art gallery. And we thought, okay, this is a picture of Gunnison in 1882. How is there an art gallery in Gunnison in 1882? And what is that? Um, it was just about the most fascinating or second most fascinating people noticed from this picture of Gunnison Main Street. The other being this one over here, which is the Oyster Depot advertising oysters directly from New York and Baltimore delivered fresh. Um, there seemed to be a fascination. This was not the only oyster establishment we found. But the earliest art, and this is a very Western notion, and one of the expansions of this project we would like to do when we continue it, because this is only a stage in a long-term project, is to again look at the artistic, or maybe better is a the term design heritage of our Native American residents, going back from to the Utes and all the way back to the Folsom people who may have you know lived on W Mountain, but to also bring that aspect into this trajectory. But we start right now with when uh European white people came and began to do art in our region and they start with the surveys. The first the Gunnison survey, uh, we have this image which was done by R.H. Kern and especially the Hayden survey which uh, was really rich in both the photography done by William Henry Jackson. This is one of the examples. William Henry Jackson is just about the most famous photographer in Colorado, um, especially of this frontier era, especially our photographs of Native Americans. He was often the photographer who did that. Uh, so he's really, you know, one of the most importantly conserved photographers. And his good friend, William Henry Holmes, who was the sketch artist who drew the survey. And this is fabulous, this drawing, because we actually see all these figures here along Italian mountain, climbing and scaling it to the top. William Henry Holmes would also be a fascinating character. He would be the first director of what becomes the Smithsonian Washington National Gallery. Uh, he's a fantastic figure in American art. What they, Holmes and Jackson, did on that survey would then be relayed back to the East Coast and in the magazine called Picturesque America would become these beautiful lithographs done by Thomas Moran. For example, the very famous image of the Mount of the Holy Cross by Moran or our own Tiakali Mountain, which were the first images of this part of the Rocky Mountains ever shown 
to East Coast people. And it is how they develop their image of what is the American West. It is these photographs and drawings that then become widely disseminated lithographs. Now, if we return back to our town of Gunnison, and as it develops in its formation in the 1880s, what we notice is in fact, art is immediately present. First of all, you remember the photograph I showed you before, that was Broomfield's art gallery. Broomfield was a, a photographer. We don't know what he carried in his art gallery, but we imagine he might have also carried lithographs and other prints for sale. And also here next to our current day Gunnison Art Center, we can see above this dry goods store, the word art studio. Uh, so we know visibly that art is present. And we also know, this is interesting, most of the early photographers are all men, but all the early painters are women. And that's really probably the most fascinating discovery we made pretty recently. One of my students was interning at the Pioneer Museum and started doing something that I, I think we've been recommending all of our friends in Colorado's local history museums do, which is look at the artwork on the wall and dust off those old labels and read them. That's what our student did. He read this and he said, view of Hartman's cow camp, Miss Monroe, 1880, and you can read the back of the painting. There's an inscription scribbled on the back that says essentially these facts. And he thought, wait a minute. He thought two questions. He said, wait a minute, 1880, this is before the town has even been incorporated. This is before there's even a railroad. And a woman whose name we only know as Miss Monroe, we don't know her first name, came over the mountain passes with her artist board and her oil paints and painted this painting for Alonzo and Annie Hartman in honor of their wedding. And this is an image of the core of old Gunnison. This is the cabin, which was the post office where Hartman had based his cow camp, which is how he essentially led to the founding of Gunnison. But the question of this painting, who is Miss Monroe? Who is this painter in Gunnison in 1880? Led us to study more, particularly the Hartman family. This is their house, the Hartman Castle, which is without a doubt the finest private home in Gunnison County. It still stands. Uh, and here in this photograph in the upper left, we know this man in the center is Alonzo Hartman, in large sense, the founder of Gunnison. And that's probably Annie Hartman behind him, his wife, who we'll talk about. And I believe this woman here is Laura Sears. I'll tell you who those people are in just a second. And this is the turret of Hartman Castle. And I'll explain what is up there too. The only painting we have of Annie Hartman in Denison County is this one painting, which is in the collection of the Pioneer Museum. And apparently it's the first painting done by Miss Hartman in 1882, soon after she would be arriving here in the Valley, marrying Alonzo Hartman. On the right, we have a surviving black and white photograph of a fresco that Annie Hartman painted in the turret of Hartman Castle. However, that fresco is no longer there. It's been painted over by something else. And uh, so we do have this surviving photograph of Annie Hartman's work. And she would be probably our first resident painter since we don't think Miss Monroe stayed. The other resident painter is Laura Sears, her close friend who came to live with her at Hartman Castle. And we have a number of works by Laura Sears, landscapes largely of the rivers, and town uh, uh, landscape around the valley. Laura and Annie would hold salons out at Hartman Castle um, on Monday afternoons where there would be art exercises and cultural events. And this is in the 1890s. Hartman Castle was really the finest home in the valley. And it was built with materials that were all bought and purchased at the Chicago 
a World's Fair in 1893, the famous White City exhibition. And it's a beautiful Art Nouveau interiors there. But we know of other artists too. Again, Mrs. Doc Shores. Now, Doc Shores is one of our key famous figures of early Gunnison, and his wife clearly is a painter, and this is one of her works, as well as two other artists we know of, Augusta H. Block, who painted cabins up in the Taylor River area, a lot of which is now under the reservoir like this, and the curious Mrs. Oatcult. We don't know her first name, but her work from the 1890s is fascinating. They're sort of painted and embroidered flowers, but they have a strange kind of post-impressionist Japaneseism, modernism to them. And all of these artists, we don't know a lot about them, but they're fascinating. And they were all just sitting there in the Pioneer Museum when we started to kind of put together who are these early artists in the valley. And we found just a surprising amount of them. Now, with the establishment of the normal school, what would become Western Colorado University in 1911, we have also the arrival of very professional, we would say probably our first professional painter, that being Henry Richter, who came to be the first art instructor at Western. He had uh, studied in Europe at uh, the Kunstgewebe Schule, which is actually, interestingly, the same school that Gustav Klimt studied at in Vienna. And then when his family moved to Chicago, he studied briefly at the Art Institute of Chicago, and then came to Western, the normal school, to take uh, his first job. Uh, and he would marry uh, an artist, Catherine, uh, from Greeley, who would move and join him, and she would also become an instructor at the school. Uh, they would practice plein air painting up in Gothic. Uh, Henry also maintained a quartet where he played, he was a good violinist, at the our famous La Vita Hotel, which is where he and Catherine lived when they were here, in here, and they lived here till 1919. Um, Henry, in the time, also took a sabbatical to travel in Europe in 1913 and 14. Had to return because of the war, uh, but has some wonderful work that he did in Europe and really brings back a lot of European post-impressionism when he comes back. And also just the traditions of plein air painting in the valley. These, if you've been inside our Savage Library at Western, will know these two massive uh, paintings that he did. Uh, both to give his students something to copy, something to admire. And these are very much in that Central European Art Nouveau style that he would have been reared in, in Vienna, where he was from. Catherine also did really beautiful landscape plein air paintings. Uh, and she also took over the teaching duties at Western and her best student is the one you can see here on her left. Catherine is on her right, uh, and then on her left is probably, really without a doubt, the first real Western painter in America, who is Isla McAfee. Isla is the first artist who is both born and raised and trained and worked her whole life in the American West. She's not an East Coast artist who transplants to the American West. She was born on a far, on a ranch near Sargent's. She used to ride her horse into town to attend classes at the normal school, which she would eventually graduate from. And she would go on to be a major figure in the Taos art colony and also to paint important we might call them WPA murals. So these large public works, for example, the one in the Gunnison Post Office. And if there's one thing I leave you with, this won't play well over a Zoom meeting, but I encourage all of you to go to YouTube and search Isla McAfee and watch her with her trained cat, Carlos, which um, just amazing tricks she had taught her cat Carlos to perform. So with that, I'm going to conclude my lecture. Um, 
if uh, uh, I want, if there's um, more uh, people would like to ask questions about, we can talk more. Um, I felt like I wanted to give people a chance to ask questions about this process because we've been working on it for, gosh, I mean, this is the fifth iteration of this exhibition. Um, Nick, Reddy, Ivy Walker, Peggy Stenmark, they worked on the first stage of it and it was shown at the OB Joyful Gallery. Um, it was also, parts of it were shown at the Mountain Heritage Museum. Uh, we had a, a seminar, a symposium already like a year and a half ago on this. And then last year we did a version of the show at the Crested Butte Arts Festival. And then we also did a version of the show at the Quigley Gallery at Western. And it, um, it just continues to grow. And that's where we sort of are at this stage now, where especially the research we did at the Pioneer Museum, we continue to find pieces and continue to add and fill out this story. And we're continuing to work on now looking at both what predates our story here in terms of the work of um, the Native American residents in the valley and then what postdates it, particularly looking towards Crested Butte and the kind of Bohemian era of the 60s and 70s and on into our present day, which is kind of the rest of the story that we want to work on picking up too. So I guess that's where we are, but we look at it as a kind of constant work in progress and one that's a really good example of how art history gets done, which is a lot of people working together. Um, a lot of people, Ethel Rice and Heather Orr had been documenting the collection at Western. Ethel Rice is particularly important in salvaging the collection of these artists who had taught and worked at Western. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, uh, looking at uh, the work of Gail Jacobs, who is um, related to the Richters, who preserve their memory and the works that they've done. And all of this coming together to try to create a kind of a sense of art history and to prove, I guess, a valid point that I guess our students always believed in, but we, we hadn't proved it yet, which is everywhere has an art history, everywhere. And people sometimes would laugh and be like, oh, come on, an art history of the Gunnison Valley, you're joking. And yet the more we did it, we we're like, no, really, there's a really, really long and deep and complex art history and one that nobody realized how deep it was um, until we started poking around and just keep asking more questions. And it's what we're going to continue to work on, you know, in the future going forward. So. I guess with that, Nell, I should probably just, you know, maybe take some questions, I guess. Right off the bat, we've got the question uh, from Tempe. Where is the exhibition and how long will it run? Oh, it breaks my heart to say this. Um, we've already had to take it down. That was the sad part. We've taken it down, but we're going to put it back up. Um, that's what I'm promising everyone. So two points. Um, Gosh, if I can focus for a second. Um, in the chat, Nell, have you seen this on Facebook? Didn't I give you the link where we made a walking tour of the exhibition? Yeah. Yes. So Nell's gonna put that in the chat. So we did a, a total walkthrough video of the exhibition. And Nell's gonna put that in the chat. So you can video walk through the entire exhibition and and and, and um, when Brianna did it at the Art Center she went every image and every didactic so you can take it and pause it and you can actually see the whole exhibition at least virtually um, and I guess one of the long-term goals and I again I don't want to shoot my mouth off about things but Nell and I were talking and other people have been talking they're like wouldn't it be really cool to establish an art museum of the Gunnison Valley so so we keep, you know, we, we keep building this collection. Now we just have built so much stuff and we have the didactic posters and the research. We have videos and that kind of stuff. Um, there's also a beautiful video that you can watch again. Well, just again, search on YouTube, Art History of the Gunnison Valley on YouTube. 
And there's a beautiful video that the Crested View Creative District funded where they interview Nick Reddy, and especially, it's particularly about the very early period of the, especially the surveys and the photographers and um, Jackson and, and Thomas Moran who made the lithographs um, about that period. So it's a beautiful video to watch about that area. So we've been building it um, and that's what I can say about our exhibition. And if anybody wants to know more about it, um, I can, tell you where all the pieces sit. And like I said, we continue to work on it. So I guess that was my first answer. I'm frantically putting links in because you've mentioned some really great resources. Those videos were fantastic. Um, sure. Really beautifully done and really uh, give a lot of great information. So my question for you is, we're talking about a lot of art from a lot of different people and from different places yeah. that kind of has yeah. been dug up. So what has yeah. been, um, what has been the challenge in bringing this, all this art together in a cohesive history? Well, it was, you know, part of the question, first of all, was, you know, an art museum, if we were thinking like an art museum, um, and in some ways we were thinking, even though we're not an art museum, we th thought about the show as if we were the art museum of the Gunnison Valley already. And so we're thinking like, what kind of story do we want to tell? And the first question was, an art museum often will have sort of qualitative prejudices. So they're going to want, and this could be true almost anywhere. If you look at museums that do handle Western art, whether the Denver Art Museum or the Onshoots or the Kirkland Museum in Denver, all of them handle it. They want only the most famous figures of that genre and the best pieces and the pieces that kind of show an advanced level of artistic activity, maybe relative to models in the East Coast or even in Europe. And that was not our precondition. Okay, so so our philosophy was it doesn't matter how good or bad you are that is not our concern we're not making any qualitative judgments here we're not judging these women artists differently because they probably weren't professional in the sense that they weren't selling their paintings for money we're not that doesn't concern us in the least if they were amateur painters we don't care that's not a concern what we are interested in is who was painting or who was making art, why were they doing it, um, and what, what were they doing, and then how were they in touch with wider tendencies? So, you know, how much were they in connection with the wider art world? Were they aware of things? Particularly with Henry Richter, I think we, because he's certainly the most famous, along with Isla McAfee, who's also pretty famous too, and and the only two, Isla McAfee and Henry Richter, are ones that we might say there's a market for their works. And I wouldn't say a super high value work. I mean, I've seen their works between five and $20,000, which is not bad money, but it's not like super famous artist money. Um, but what I would say about them is that they were deeply interested in what was going on in art. And I know that Henry Richter, I'm pretty sure what I'm trying to figure out is if he, when he was in going to Europe, he would have probably gone through New York. And if he did, did he visit the famous Armory Show, which is this kind of seminal event that really just twisted American art towards modernism in a way that can never be overstated how much then modernism. And all I know is that in, a few years later, after Henry had returned from Europe, in 1919, in Denver, there's a really interesting event in the kind of early history of modernism in Colorado called the 1919 Denver Armory Show that was held at the library in Denver. They used the expression armory show, not because it was in an armory, because it was in a library, but because the term armory show had become so famous in America, it meant modernism. And Henry is one of 12 artists who participated in that show. So it shows us that, you know, he really is, he is interested in modern art. He wants to be part of it. 
and he wants to um, emphasize that modern art can be done out here in the West. And that's where I think Isla McAfee, again, really showed like she is born and raised in the West. She's born and raised in the West. She's trained in the West. And her whole career is basically in the West, at, in Taos, for the whole year. And she is an important figure in the Taos scene, which you cannot, again, you can't overstate how important Taos is in American art history. Um, you know, there's basically, you know, there's Boston and Philadelphia, and then there's New York, and New York starts to dominate. And then after New York, the next big center is Taos. Taos is really important. Um, the whole scene that moves out there with Mabel Dodge and other key figures, D.H. Lawrence and all these figures that are out there. And Isla McAfee is really central and part of that. Um, she is really quite an important figure in that. And that's where I think you kind of start to see that even if we were a small, isolated little place, we're starting to have, you know, an impact that we're producing people like Isla McAfee who are so central to a wider American artistic identity. That's what I would say. Wow, that, that is really cool. Uh, our next question is, uh, are the drawings, paintings, etc., locally held? Good question, good question. They are a big mix. Okay, so I'll tell you the inventory. The, the stuff from the surveys, um, the Hayden survey, the um, Gunnison survey, those are, those are, we were using reproductions. We don't have those drawings. Those I think are in like the national archives and stuff. Um, so, but what, um, what Nick Reddy used the budget that was given to the creative district was he made really nice reproductions of those um, Henry Jackson and, 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 and Holmes drawings and photographs. So those were done. Um, the other photographs, for example, um, the one of Main Street Gunnison. The, as I understand, the original of that is, owned, is, is in the collection of the Denver Library, which is often the repository of a lot of these things. Multiple reproductions of that photograph can be seen. There's one that hangs in um, the halls of Western couple versions of it hanging in the Pioneer Museum. So you can see those around that photographs again. Um, the originals, again, I think are, are either with History Colorado or with the Denver Public Library that right now that tends to be the, you know, co conservators of these crucial things, right? The Denver Public Ar Library collection is phenomenal. It's yeah. really an amazing repository. Yeah. And that's where a lot of this starts. It was just, you know, their, their repository is so wonderful and searchable. We just start poking around like photographs of Gunnison and then enlarge it and then read the signs. That's what you do. And you can, oh, I mean, amazing things if you actually read what the signs say in these photographs. Um, and that was how we started. Now, a lot of the paintings, like the Richter collection, Henry and Catherine Richter, that is a local collector um, who wanted to be anonymous. Um, and then the bulk of the remaining artwork that we used for this collect, this show is at the Pioneer Museum. Um, and then in other versions, for example, the Preston Mountain Heritage Museum lent us pieces that we used in earlier versions. Um, and so those are in their collection, and I think that's the bulk of it. Um, and and I think yeah, Nick Reddy and Ob Joyful Gallery have been collecting some things that have been available, original works. That it's quite a passion of Nick's to to actually collect that stuff. So he's been doing a great job trying he's to collect some things. Really cool stuff, and a lot yeah. of photography too. Yeah, exactly. A lot of that. He really got he really got fascinated by this question. Oh my God! Look at all these photographers, George Mellon, and all these ones. And I just talked about some of the Gunnison ones, but there were photographers in Irwin and Crested Butte, and these guys were art photographers. Okay, they were they were not like functional. They had come out here to photograph the landscape because the landscape was pretty and people liked it. And it was landscape photography and they were making it for a market who wanted that and they were making things like um 
what do we call them? stereograms? What do we call them now? The stereo viewers? Yeah, very popular. So a lot of the photography they were doing was going to be used that way to make these um, stereo view uh, uh, photographs. And then people could really feel like they were in the mountains. And you have to remember for the East Coast people, they've never seen mountains this big. They've just never seen it. And this is these are the people who are transmitting this imagery of how dramatic and huge the Rockies are, they're transmitting this back to the East Coast and creating a fascination and a cult of the American West. This is how it's created. Uh, the next question we have is, interesting that so many of the painters here were women. Was that common throughout the US at that time? I'm gonna say, I'm gonna guess, because I haven't researched it really that completely, but I'm gonna say yes. I'm going to say yes because of a couple of reasons. One, one of the reasons I undertook this was my PhD dissertation research was on the history of the Hungarian art market. And again, it might seem pretty obscure, like some people laugh. Oh, was there a Hungarian art market? Well, yes. In fact, there was a huge one. Um, you know, any nation of 10 to 12, 15 million people is going to have their own little art history and an art market that built that art history, and that's certainly true with Hungary. Um, so I wrote this art history, art, art history of the art market, starting in the 1800s, when a market dealers and galleries start to appear, and then salons and other types of things appear. And what became apparent was by the late 19th century, by the late 1800s, in Hungary, there are a lot of women in the art world by then. There were a lot of women in the art world by the 1820s. Art painting in general, art is one of the frontiers where women cross boundaries pretty much earlier than they crossed those boundaries in almost any other field of production. So, I mean, we know women painters from the 1500s. We don't know a lot of women who worked in anything else, but we know the name of women who painted in the 1500s. We know a lot of women who painted in the 1600s, and we know things about them, and we don't know a whole lot about women. Anyway, so what I'm saying is, again, our earliest, we have really important art dealers who are some of the most important art dealers in history who are women, and they're working already in the 1920s and 30s. Now, in any other field of business activity, we don't have major women making a major impact for decades. So what I'm saying is women are always, art and painting seem to, and it may have something to do with the fact that it was both a profession and a hobby. And to be fair, these women were pigeonholed when they pursued painting. That was a good pursuit for a good, idle gentlewoman to do painting, but not pursue it professionally. That wasn't okay. But then, once they have the training, some of them do pursue it professionally, and that's the point. But I think to answer the question why so many, it, whether in Hungary or out here in the West, studying art was seen as a good thing for a culture trained, sophisticated woman to do. Now, that also, though, should be understood that here in the West, this is true across. The kind of frontier process, which is, you know, decades moving across the American West. Women will be the bringers of culture. And that's, they felt, I mean, they would say it in plain words. Woman, it is your job to bring culture. You know, it was a standard calling for women in the 19th century that they brought culture. They brought civilization. And that could come in many forms. They also were expected to bring religion. And, but they also were to bring music and they were to bring, but they were also to bring the arts. They were to bring visual arts and painting and culture. And so that was seen. And I, certainly Annie Hartman and her friend Laura Sears definitely felt that was their mission for Gunnison. They were gonna make Gunnison a cultured place. And that's why they had the salons and that's why they painted and it doesn't surprise me that they, they saw painting as a, as a proper route to a cultured and civilized community. So women had to bring the culture and the sidewalks. That's what I'm understanding. 
<laughs> yeah, they did. They did. They did. But I mean, you, I mean, if you look at the discourse of the time, it was often said, you know, in that kind of very gender pigeonholing kind of way, you know, men, you go out and do the ranching and build the bridges and things and ladies, you bring the culture, you know, I mean, it was, you know, seen as that. Um, but but to be fair, those women took it up very enthusiastically and they did bring culture, to be fair, they did, they really did. So how do you see this kind of, this, this legacy of art in our valley playing into who we are today and, I, and our identity as a community today? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really profound one. I think it's a really deep and profound one. Um, and it goes back to our earliest, moments. We're looking at that Hayden survey, those drawings by Holmes, the photographs by Jackson. We've put them here in an art history lecture because we're considered them art, but they were functional. Those photographs and drawings were drawn with a purpose to figure out where to lay the railroad so we could get at the minerals in these mountains. It was very functional. And it was interesting, we were making art to glorify the beauty of the environment, but at the same time we were drawing art so as to effectively exploit the environment. Um, both things were true at the same time. And in the 19th century, early 20th century, it didn't appear necessarily contradictory. But if we follow a tendency within American art that we call the Hudson Valley School, which Thomas Moran is essentially after a while they get, you know, they stop doing the Hudson Valley and they start doing the American West. But there is a trend that runs through all of those, which is this question about the use of our landscape. And it's already a very prescient question already in the 19th century is should we be using this landscape for the beauty that it is present or should we be using this landscape to exploit it for modernist, you know, industrialization goals. And for a long time, the latter was the case. But at some point, these things, they coexist for a long time, but at some point they begin to reach a conflict. And in Butte, that conflict happens in the 1970s with the famous um, Red Lady state, which is, which I think Adnell knows it so well, you just can't overstate how profound that conflict was. It was really deeply profound from a 21st century kind of, perspective, where essentially you have the hippies saying the landscape is more valuable as the landscape because it's beautiful. And there's a famous line, I don't know if it's apocryphal, but apparently like, who was it? Tony, somebody, Coach, who was it who said, you know, when the ski guy said, look at that landscape, and he said, you can't eat a landscape, right? Now, what's this anecdote? I, I can't, I don't know who said it originally, but that was a common uh, old timer. Uh, right, the, yeah. the, the miners would say that to the ski bums, like, oh, fine, you can look at your landscape, it's not worth anything. And what is wrong is yes, you can eat that landscape. That's what the late 20th century postmodernist development model proved. Yes, you can eat a landscape. A lot of people can make a living off an untrammeled landscape. And that was what the Red Lady proved. And it became this deeply profound statement where we began to look at this artistic and cultural heritage which celebrates the landscape in its unmolested form, and for that reason, has become the economy of the 21st century. And I, I, I really do see it as an extremely profound development, one that's being sort of understood in communities across Colorado, especially creative district communities. They've all kind of gone through this weird process where you know, these towns like Crested Butte, Gunnis, uh, 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 Telluride, Aspen, these towns have literally gone through the greatest crests, dips, and crests again in the history of the real estate market. No towns had real estate that was that crazy valuable, became that worthless, and then became that crazy valuable again. And it has a lot to do with this transformation from an extraction economy to then an 
whatever outdoor rec scenic you know autonomy which they become but often ones that incorporate a lot of cultural production in the same synergy I never thought of it that way before. Thanks for framing it like that. That's a really interesting way to look at that. Um, one last question for you, since you kind of got on that topic of like the importance of art in representing the scenery and the fetishization of the scenery. Um, yeah. You know, we kind of credit the Hayden survey with establishing our first national park, Yellowstone. Yeah. Yeah, and that's right. So would you talk a little bit about that fetishization and the process that yeah. that and you know our concept of yeah. the West? Yeah, it's it's funny because it's like both things happen at the same time. They're out there to survey it to find out how to exploit it. You know, how we can get minerals out of this, where we can graze cattle out of this, is there farmland here, is there gold here? They want to get stuff out of here. And yet, what happens in the process is the opposite. They began to see the landscape and realize it need not be exploited at all. It needs to be left as it is. And both things are recognized at the same time. And that's what Yellowstone is, is that moment where they come into a landscape and they're like, whoa, I mean, there might be some things here, but look at this landscape. And, and that's, and Nell has the right term, fetishization. It's a process, it's going on all over Europe and the United States, this process, it's what we call romanticism. It starts in Europe with, you know, again, people looking at landscape and the Lake District and Kind of feeling like it means something as this and then as i mentioned we have these artists which our artists certainly have a debt to so, and thomas moran the one who made the lithograph of cape Cod, he is a hudson valley school painter you would learn about him in art history school i mean as a hudson valley painter and that's this defining feature of the hudson valley school which is very profound is excuse me, artists start to paint the Hudson River area up from New York City, and it's a nice landscape. I mean, trust me, it's not as dramatic as ours, but it's pretty nice, nice landscape. And yet, there's a discourse going on there, which is, should we exploit this? Is industrialization good? Is it bad? Is it possible to have this landscape and not exploit it? They've already, uh, and that's the thing, by the late 19th century, People had seen industrialization and they'd seen the pollution it can produce. And they were aware if you exploit this landscape, it will not look the same. And it will not look nice, it will not smell nice, um, and it won't be like this. So if you want to exploit it, you're going to ruin it. And I think that was aware. And that's why I think the Yellowstone revelation was so profound. That at some point they were like, there are some landscapes that are so special, maybe we should just leave them alone. And then, as we saw, that logic began to spread throughout the West till we reached the Red Lady in, you know, in the 1970s in Crested View, where, again, we're looking at a landscape and saying it's worth more. And they were doing the same thing in Montana a few years ago, where they were saying, you know, this gold mine that they want to make in Montana, it's not worth it. The landscape is worth more. And when you do some real complicated economic analysis of the facts, it's hard to justify a gold mine because, yeah, the landscape is worth more. Well, and so much of that has to do with the portrayal through art. Um, if you could remind me, what was the book that they create that was created following? Yeah, it's called Picturesque America. Picturesque America would be like the Life magazine of the 19th century. Okay, so Picturesque America is big. This is right before. They've developed the technology to reproduce photography in, in print journals. So print journals still have to use lithographs, you know, which is a complex process involving an artist making a picture and then someone else etching it in, um, you know, the uh, wax model. And then you know, so it's complicated, but that's how pictures were put in books or journals. And Picturesque America was the most popular picture journal um, of the 1870s. And it's how people in America who probably didn't get to travel around a whole lot learned what the rest of America looked like. And that's why, you know, we really just 
have to emphasize how important those lithographs that Moran made for that really, you know, that, that, that Mount of the Holy Cross, that's a really important picture. That is a really important picture in American psychology as it created this, oh, these complex notions of manifest destiny and, you know, our, 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 you know, this, this notion of God gave us the right to settle the West and all of those concepts are, as we were saying, they're embodied in the art. That's how they're transmitted. It's really amazing how much art has influenced our concept of the West and, and the yeah. history that resulted thereafter. Well, we're oh, coming yeah. up on our time. Uh, Jeff, is there any last things that you want to get in there before we call it a night? No, just thanks to everyone. And like I said, um, we're, it's an ongoing project. So if, you, if somebody knows things or knows about artworks or knows about an artist we should know about, tell us because like i said it's an ongoing project mm -hmm. definitely well thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us tonight we really appreciate it uh thank you to everybody who joined us this evening remember we are in the middle of our holiday history raffle with amazing prizes that you don't want to miss out on be sure to go to crestabutemuseum.com to uh, get your raffle tickets or feel free to call us at 349-1880 or our store is also open. We are open. Feel free to stop by 331 Elk Avenue, corner of 4th and Elk. You know where we are. We love to see you all. Uh, of course, masks and socially distanced, but we'd love to see you all. Good night, everybody, and thank you again, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.